Hallo, ik ben Mark Chavan. Ik ga straks een interview maken met Ben Rhodes, die medewerker van Obama was. En het interview is in het Engels, want dat is de taal die hij spreekt. We zitten hier in het ambassadehotel aan de Herengracht in Amsterdam en af en toe komt er een auto voorbij. Alleen maar om te bewijzen dat het echt gebeurd is. Ben Rhodes is in the Netherlands to talk about his just published memoir, The World As It Is. We'll talk about that in this podcast. Ben Rhodes joined Barack Obama's presidential campaign already in 2008. He came along to his White House and became a deputy national security advisor. Ben Rhodes was part of key crisis meetings on all these topical subjects like the Arab Spring, the American death of bin Laden, policy on Afghanistan, Iraq and the Iran nuclear deal. He participated in the famous Syria red line discussions. He stayed with Obama till the end and the day Donald Trump won his victory in 2016. Well, Ben, welcome to the show. We are very happy to have you. Thanks. Um, I apologize in advance that I might utter the word Trump every now and then. That's fine. Everybody does at some point. Uh, it seems to be uh, all around us. Yes. And you are in a, in a very privileged position to give us some guidance on this baffling new reality. Yeah. But we are really missing the Obama White House so much. Everybody benefits from a comparison. <laughs> <laughs> uh. But w- w- what is it? Anger or sadness that, that really is prevailing in your mind and in your heart? Um, you know, I think it's it's really more sadness um, because for me, it's not just uh, watching, you know, certain policies, you know, be opposed or dismantled by Trump. Everybody assumes that what is most distressing to someone like me is, you know, he's pulling out of the Iran nuclear deal, for instance, or the Paris Climate Accord. Um But what is more sad to me is to watch this office of the U.S. presidency, which I care a lot about. And I gave eight years of my life to making that office function as well as it could be diminished. Um, You know, we used to, as a speechwriter, care about every word, every phrase. You know, I stayed up nights agonizing, you know, about how to say something. And they have just a complete disregard for for uh, truth, for 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 words. Um, we spent so much time trying to build and strengthen our relationships with other countries and with the, the publics in other countries. He, he has this kind of hostility to America's traditional friends and certainly the views of people in places like Holland, right? So... It's very hard as an American to, to watch uh, essentially the most important office in our country be diminished and debased like that and to know that it's also shaping the opinions of people around the world. Good morning. Every day all across the world, American diplomats and civilians work tirelessly to advance the interests and values of our nation. Often uh, they are away from their families. Sometimes they brave great danger. Yesterday, four of these extraordinary Americans were killed in an attack on our diplomatic post in Benghazi. Can you, to the Dutch audience, explain why Benghazi grew out to what it was? It it, it was kind of, you know, a crazy situation. And I I wanted in the book to, to tell that Benghazi story because I think, in a way, it explains Trump, or at least it helps to explain Trump. You know, so essentially what happened was, we have this attack in Benghazi that tragically takes the life of our ambassador and three other Americans. Uh, at the same time, that week, there are violent protests all over the Middle East because of this video on the internet that uh, depicted the prophet of Muhammad in a bad light. Not unlike the cartoons, um, uh, that emanated from here. And so our, in our first analysis of what happened, we connected 
what happened in Benghazi to this video, that, that people showed up to protest this video and, and, and then violence ensued. Um, ultimately, I think our intelligence community changed its view that um, some of the people who came there, you know, had a plan to attack the facility. So, it, it, you know, a slight evolution as you get more information. This one minor uh, uh, thing in terms of like how we presented what happened, first it became it received truth among Obama critics that we'd invented this video, that the, the, literally the video didn't exist in a way, that we, we had kind of concocted it as an excuse for what happened in Benghazi to cover something up. Um, which is absurd on its face because the video does exist and there were violent protests all over the Middle East because of it. Um, but then it grew and grew and the conspiracy theories grew. You know, Obama watched the attack take place and refused to help the Americans. Um, we were running guns through Benghazi to Muslim Brotherhood, you know, operatives in Syria. Uh, I mean, one theory after another. And I became kind of a target because I was allegedly the person who'd invented the story about this video to, to protect this cover-up, right? Um, and at first, I kind of dismissed it because it, it seemed so crazy. Um, and I remember Obama, I said, described in the book, him, him not believing me when I was explaining to him as he was preparing for presidential debates, here are all these theories um, that you have to be aware of. Uh, and he'd said, this is crazy stuff. You know, do people actually believe this? And I was like, no, this is on Fox News Channel. Um, and so what happened for years is the story just didn't go away. And the Republicans kept investigating Benghazi. Uh, nobody could even really say what they were looking for. It was just it was all to just keep this going. Um, and I described the very strange experience of having a White House Twitter account, a social media account where – you know, on, on some days, you know, most days, uh, I'd only hear from a few dozen people tweeting at me. But then there'd be these huge spikes, you know, a thousand people just enraged all at once, you know, launching at me with some conspiracy theory. And they were all contradictory. You know, one day I'd be part of a global Jewish conspiracy and the next day I'd be in the Muslim Brotherhood, you know. And, and you realize in that moment that somewhere in this right-wing media ecosystem uh, – you know, a talk radio segment had run or Breitbart had run a story. And, and, and you, I started to realize how large that world was, it, like tens of millions of people are just living in a reality where Benghazi is a massive conspiracy theory. And Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton and people like me willfully lied and covered something up and, you know, we need to get to the truth of what we were covering up. And, and, of course, it was all basically fake. You so know, when it didn't go away, what did you decide to try and do about it? So at first, I would try to correct the record, right? So I describe an incident in the in the book where uh, an email was released of mine that conf seemed to confirm the theory. And then I went back and checked my email and realized that they had completely faked my email, that it wasn't <laughs> what I'd written. And so we, you know, out of the White House, put out the actual email and said, see, you know, what I had actually said at the time was that, you know, was factual. And, and what was interesting is that that didn't matter. You know, it didn't change anything. You know, like the people who were wanted to believe the conspiracy theory didn't care if you fact-checked And how did you perceive the treatment of the mainstream media of, of the matter? So this is really... Correct or not? Did it register with them? No, no. This was really interesting and it's relevant to, to Trump as well because they would all cover this. You know, the Republicans would go out and say, we did terrible things and this is horrible and we need to investigate this again and again and again. They investigated it for four years. Um, uh, I mean, more, far longer than you know, any similar incident uh, in American history. And if you said to a mainstream reporter, you know there's nothing to this, they would agree in private and say, yeah, we know, but we have to cover it because the Republicans are making such a big deal of it. 
So in a way, the Republicans just kind of created the appearance of scandal and and their media, the right wing media, covered it as if it was the most important story in the world for years. The mainstream media covered it because it was a he said, she said. Well, the Republicans said that the White House lied about Benghazi to cover up something awful and the White House denies it. <laughs> you know? And so that became the frame, right? And, and you couldn't break it. And uh, has this experience changed the mainstream media into telling it as they see it? I, I, I think Trump... Um, so, so I think this is important understanding Trump, first of all, because Trump kind of emerges from this conspiracy theory-minded part of the Republican Party. Remember, his whole rise to power was based on the conspiracy theory that Barack Obama was born in Africa. I mean, literally, that's what launched his political career. Um, he lives in this world of Fox, the Fox News Channel, which, again, just validates a certain worldview, even if it's not factual. Um, I think since Trump got elected, the mainstream media has not fully adjusted. On the one hand, you know, they are much tougher in pointing out when Trump is lying and fact-checking his lies. Um, however, they still report on his every tweet, you know, and, and, and they still kind of cover him in, in a strange way on his terms because um, he doesn't care if they say he lies because his own media will say he's telling the truth. And, you know, I, I've had this strange experience, for instance, of like, you, you go on television in the United States, if Trump tweets, they break into the, the program to, to read this tweet on television. Oh, and, sweet. and And, and you, you want to say to them, you don't need to do this. You know, the, 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 the Twitter isn't news. Ripping children away from their families on the southern border. That's the, that's the news, you know. What they're actually doing is, is the news. So the media has gotten better, again, at fact-checking, but they're still kind of engaging Trump on, on his terms, on his terrain, you know, covering his tweets, covering his personal insults, you know, covering his bombastic behavior, um, which in, in a way is not the real story of the Trump presidency. The real story is what they're actually doing. Uh, if, you, if you reconsider from the first campaign in 2008, the people that were engaged to, to vote, to follow Obama into his first and second term, on the way, you must have lost a number of people that went over to Trump. Yes. Have you realized during the course of those eight years that a number of disenchanted people were going the other way and believing into that other news ecosphere. Yeah, what's strange about it is that um, Obama was personally popular. You know, at the end of his presidency, he had the highest approval rating he'd had since the beginning of his presidency. Um, so what was what we missed in a way is that his own charisma and appeal to voters allowed him to es to 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 escape um, the fate that Hillary Clinton had. In other words, this backlash was already there in 2012, and he won decisively for re-election. You know, I think if he had run in 2016, if he could have run for a third term, he would have won decisively. Um, but when the Democrats ran in elections and he wasn't on the top of the ticket, so the two congressional elections uh, in 2010 and 2014 and then the 2016 presidential election, the backlash was too strong for them to overcome without a kind of charismatic individual. Um, and, and I think we did probably underestimate uh, the strength of that backlash because he was able to overcome it in his own elections. Um, I do think that you know there are some people who voted for Obama twice and then Trump. This is you know, the, and, and actually, if if those people had not voted for Trump, Hillary Clinton would have won. Um, and I do think that uh, a large part of the reason why they voted the way they did is because of the the, the the media they consume. Um, that that essentially you have people who 
you know, if you watch Fox News, um, you, you're likely to believe a certain reality. You write somewhere in the book about the comparison of the 2008 Obama campaign criticizing Hillary for yeah. her being corrupt, part of the establishment, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, taking money from Wall Street. Yeah. And then after he resigned, Obama gave a couple of well-paid speeches to Wall Street and went, uh, what is it, water diving with uh, Richard Branson. Yeah. That disappointed his fans in yeah, the Netherlands. Yeah. Yeah. Can yeah. you explain? Well, I I do think um, there is a a difference, uh, an important difference. And look, I'm not, you know, I didn't go water driving with Richard Branson, so I I, I don't feel compelled to you know defend every action Obama takes. I think the the, the here's the difference. Um, the 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 criticisms about Hillary Clinton, and you know speeches at Wall Street and, and money she's taking from Wall Street for that. And these are things she's doing before she's president, right? And so obviously the concern is people are aiming to buy influence for when she's president. Um, I do think it's different if, you know, Obama is never going to hold political office again in his life. Um, he's retired. He's prevented by the Constitution for running for president again. So it's not like they're buying any influence. Excess. He can, yeah. So uh, again, you could still say, well, you know, he should have, you know, different company to keep and, and that's fine. That's fair. People can say that. But I do think there's a substantive difference that um, nobody's buying access or influence uh, with him because he's retired. Whereas the appearance with the Clintons for some time was that the reason people are paying all this money is that, you know, she's going to get in the White House and then they're going to ask her for something. But the dis disappointment globally, I think, was based on maybe the mistaken sanctity of Obama, who had been striving for purity and decency and modesty. Yeah. Modesty in the reach of the American power, modesty yeah. in behavior. Yeah. Solidarity. Yeah. And those values, many people without money. Yes, find hard to, to swallow that once you're free, you go with giving yeah. free ad publicity to this billionaire travel uh, magnet, uh, yeah. what have you. Wall Street people who uh, swim in money. Yeah, Those should not be the pals of our yeah. hero. Was that educating the people that he's not a hero anymore? Or what was it? Well, it's an interesting question. I mean... Um, uh, I don't think he was trying to, you know, make a point. Um, I will say that the office of former president is very odd <laughs> um, because <laughs> you can't live a normal life. Um, I mean, I remember actually I traveled with him, uh, when, you know, after he was president and on, on his foreign travel, and um, he still has Secret Service protection. He can't go for a walk. I actually remember we were going to be in Paris and I wanted to stay an extra day. And he's like, if we stay an extra day, I can only sit in my hotel room. I, I can't, like, he's not allowed to go for a walk. The Secret Service, you know, won't let him, you know. Um, or they'd have to shut down the whole city to let him take a walk, right? And, in, in, and I think he would prefer that. I, I think he'd prefer to be a normal person and, and to be able to drive himself. Fly and coach. Walk. And yeah, but... The, so if he wants to vacation, I mean, I know this sounds absurd, but I'm just giving the most honest answer I can. He has to go to like a private island, you know, because he can't come to Amsterdam and walk by the canals, which he would love to do. Um, and so it, it, it does complicate matters. And you almost have no choice but to live in some kind of bubble like that. Um, uh, it, it is very, it's a very odd thing. Speaking of a bubble, I, I, I was very almost moved by your pages about flying over Hiroshima. Yeah. Is this man a sage? Yeah, yeah. You're, you're returning to the place America bombed to, yeah. to zero, and you're contemplating about history. Yeah. I thought that that was one of the most revealing pieces of Obama's character. I, you know, I tried in the book to show people what he was like, not just, you know, at the head of the table, but in car rides and hotel rooms and, 
this conversation we had it was kind of a running thread for 10 years about everything. And that was a revealing moment because we were flying into Hiroshima, which was an eerie experience. You know, to be – he's the first American president to go back to Hiroshima. We're literally flying in a U.S. military helicopter from a U.S. military base over the city, right? So you're looking down at the city that we destroyed. It is not the fact of war that sets Hiroshima apart. Artifacts tell us that violent conflict appeared with the very first man, our early ancestors, having learned to make blades from flint and spears from wood, used these tools not just for hunting, but against their own kind. On every continent, the history of civilization is filled with war whether driven by scarcity of grain or hunger for gold, compelled by nationalist fervor or religious zeal. You know, he was talking about uh, the history of human beings. And um, I, at first I thought, what, 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 what is this about? <laughs> this is way off topic. You know, um, He's talking about the shift from hunter-gatherers and the mastery of technology and – you know, uh, how technological advances were not always good for mankind and this. And, and it seemed like he was avoiding Hiroshima. But then I realized, oh, wait, he's he's What's actually he's talking about it. He's, he's saying that that inexorably, as mankind masters certain technology, they've always mastered a certain kind of destruction and that the atomic bomb um, uh, is the, the, the clearest manifestation of that. And what was interesting is that we had this incredibly powerful moment where we're standing there in the middle of the city that had been totally destroyed. And uh, he greets two survivors of the atomic bomb. You know, and he's the president of the country that dropped this weapon and destroyed the city. And as soon as we got in the car to leave, he picked up this conversation again. Um, and somehow we returned to the example of the Mongols and Genghis Khan. And he said... You know, in their case, it was good horsemanship. Um, and his point was that good horsemanship was the atomic bomb of its time. You know, it allowed them to pillage cities. But this um, was the history professor, yeah. the philosopher king. Yeah, yeah. Realizing what you describe in the book, um, the Iran deal, pulling yeah. out American troops yeah. as, as much as possible from Afghanistan yeah. and Iraq, lost wars. Yeah. The red line Syria moments. I wondered, is this man, was the White House you participated so intimately in, too good for this world? If you compare that to yeah. Trump, who who, who is uh, boasting and, and yeah. intimidating, surprising, is, is Trump more tuned to this world than this wonderfully philosophical President yeah. Obama? Well, you know, if you look at I think that, that that's a very interesting question and, and, and a fair critique, right, which is if you look at the Nobel Peace Prize address he gave, Obama essentially does indicate that you can't have purity in political office. In, in other words, in a, in a, he, he, that whole speech is basically about the fact that he can't live up to the ideals of his heroes, Martin Luther King, Mahatma Gandhi, Nelson Mandela – as president of the United States, because there's evil, and you have to use force at times to combat evil. And obviously, he was criticized from the left for using drones and um, for not completely ending those wars. But clearly, he was someone who had a deep uh, ambivalence about war. Um, I, I think that in that Hiroshima speech that we were just talking about, you know, he basically describes it that that mankind has two stories you know there's there's the positive story of progress of human progress and the capacity of people to become more tolerant of others um, and more inclusive and open in their societies to use technology for good um, to cure disease and to feed people um, and then there's always been the more primal and tribal um, uh, version where 
you know, we define ourselves in opposition to other people and we use technology to kill other people and we reject those who are different. Um, and those two stories have always been in competition. Um, and right now they're very much in competition. And what is so baffling, I think, about the United States right now is that we went from one extreme to another. <laughs> you know, we went from the most inclusive kind of leader that we've ever had to the most tribal and I would argue racist uh, kind of le leader that um, uh, th that we've had certainly in recent memory. Um, you th you say Trump is a racist. Of course he's a racist. Um, I mean, I don't What's even... What's the best proof? That he built his political career on the lie that the first African-American president was born in Africa. <laughs> you know, I mean, if that's not racist, I don't know what is. You know, I mean, uh, he never said that, you know... Um, they, they never made the white presidents produce their birth certificate. Uh, Bannon denies that he built his campaign on that. He did. Like he did in News Year last week. Of course he did. I mean, if you look at, at 2011 and 2000, 2010, 2011, Donald Trump entered American politics telling that lie. That's how he attracted a significant amount of attention, flirted with running for president uh, in 2012 uh, in that election based on that lie. There's no... Uh, evidence whatsoever. It's not even something that's in doubt. I mean, <laughs> Barack Obama was born in Hawaii. There's a birth notice in the newspaper. <laughs> was it a uh, risk, by the way, for Obama to, if you recall the Charles uh, Charleston yeah. amazing grace moment, yeah. which was a very black American moment, yeah. was it a risk for him to do, to confirm almost what all these whiteies Make no, no. I mean, look, he's an African American, um, but African American, not not um, Kenyan born. Uh, I, I I think that um, again, America. I mean, to take the we were talking at a very high level about these two stories. America's always been two stories. Um, you know, America is a country that could be founded on the declaration that all men are created equal at the same time that there's slavery, right? And Barack Obama represents the the threat of American history that is progressive, that includes the civil rights movement, and that sees African Americans as fundamentally a part of what the United States is. Um, but that you know that doesn't exclude white people or or any other race or religion. Um, Donald Trump tends you know comes out of the 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 side of America that wants to exclude, I think, immigrants, and uh, you know has certainly not been uh, in the forefront of promoting greater equality and civil rights. And, and so, you know, when Obama expresses viscerally that African-American experience of America in Charleston, I actually, even though I'm white, found that to be one of the most American things that he did as president. You know, it, it, that's an expression of, you know, I mean, Amazing Grace is a hymn – you know, written by a white person that was became kind of very important to to black people. You know, it, it shows that there's, uh, you know, we can all share something. Um, it's American history. It's American history right there. I mean, it just you could hear in his voice and you could feel expressed in that church everything back to the civil rights movement and the anti-slavery movement. You could, you know, that it was all there in the the expression that was emerging in this church where a white person, a white supremacist had come in and, 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 and killed these, these African-Americans. Coming back to foreign policy and goodness, could uh, Obama have done the Kim summit? Should he have done? Yeah, you know, I mean... I, <laughs> I mean, it, 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 Trump just placed a few rude tweets and he had his summit. Yeah, but I mean, I, I first of all, I entirely support um, diplomacy with North Korea. It's far preferable to a war. I, I think that summit, the problem with it was Trump wanted the spectacle, so they rushed it and they didn't take the time to prepare for it. I mean, we, you know, in the book I detail with Iran and Cuba, years of preparation before we reached agreements. And and Trump so wanted the cameras on him that, you know, he basically gave away a bunch of things, um, substantive things like military exercises with South Korea, symbolic things like saying Kim Jong-un is beloved by his people and got nothing in return other than the North Koreans once again promising someday to give up their nuclear weapons, which they've done several times now. So, 
while I support the diplomacy, I thought the summit was a bit of a disaster. Um, I, I wish we'd had an opening with the North Koreans. The challenge that we had um, that can't be overstated is that, um, you know, we never had a South Korean president who supported diplomacy. We had a right wing South Korean government the whole time. Now so that, that was Trump's piece of luck. Well, yeah. Now you have a left wing uh, president in South Korea who actually initiated the diplomacy. I mean, let's, you know, th what happened essentially was he, President Moon, <laughs> was so worried about what was happening that around the Olympics, you know, he went out of his way to, to reach out and, uh, and then essentially, you know, brought this back to the White House and said, you should do this. But again, I actually, I don't even think he intended for there to be a presidential summit so fast. And, and so my worry is that, that Trump may have, you know, gotten far less out of this opportunity than, than any other <laughs> thoughtful administration would have. But uh, take the comparison to the Iran deal. You labored for years yeah. to get it yeah. on the road, and he kicks it off the road in one hit. Well, and that's what's so, what's so... Will he be possibly more successful in oh, getting more out of them? Absolutely not. I mean, what is so infuriating about this whole set of issues is the Iran deal is carefully negotiated over years. It has... It's 160-plus pages. It has the most intrusive international inspections and monitoring regime. Uh, the Iranians are shipping 98% of their nuclear material out of the country. There are very specific constraints on what they can and can't do. And Trump declares it a disaster. I don't think he's even read it. I don't think he even, frankly, knows what's in it. Then he goes and meets Kim Jong-un, gets a 400-word <laughs> joint statement that, that has no inspections, no limitations, Nothing. And he wants to, you know, declare himself, you know, the winner of the Nobel Peace Prize. So there's, an, there's a kind of almost dystopian absurdity uh, to it. It's not based in fact that how can this one deal that is so rigorous be a disaster and this other deal that is so empty be a triumph. You know, it just shows uh, with Trump it's all about the spectacle. And I think with the Iranians, um, if you wanted to improve the deal— He had an opportunity. I think President Macron in particular really offered him uh, a process, you know, where he – Macron essentially said, okay, let's keep the Iran deal in place and then negotiate up from it. You know, so we go to the Iranians and say, from the foundation of this deal, we would like to add other elements. Um, and Trump rejected that. You know, so he actually rejected an effort to try to – you know, address other aspects of Iran's, you know, ballistic missile program, for instance. Um, and, and so now I think the reality is that at best, you know, Europe is somehow is able to preserve um, the, the existing Iran agreement. I don't think they can, frankly, without us. This week, um, Trump is uh, coming back to the NATO summit and telling these softies in Europe that they finally should step up their efforts, which Obama also expressed. Yeah. Will he be more effective with his rude behavior again? I don't know, but um, the reality is that um, any extra dollars he might, or euros, um, he might get out of uh, Europe on defense spending is not worth the damage he's doing to the alliance. Um, you know, the, an alliance depends, yes, on military capability, But far more so, it depends on trust. And, you know, NATO depends on the belief that, you know, the United States in particular will come to the defense of any ally. And Trump, in a way that no other president has, has raised doubts about whether we would do that. And and so, you know, if I'm I think you'll have some Eastern European allies, for instance, who are doubting America's commitment and that makes them more vulnerable to Russian influence. You have other NATO allies, like the Dutch, for instance, you know, who we've asked to be a part of military interventions in Afghanistan or Libya or you know, other places you know, that are probably not particularly popular in Holland, right? But uh, you stuck with them because we're in alliance. Well, the next time we come to Holland and say, you know, would you want to join us in this uh, you know, overseas mission? I think you'll probably more, be more skeptical because you have this president of the United States who's... Without credibility. Yeah, exactly. So um, 
I, I, I think that Trump's uh, bullying, even if it does yield some slight increases in defense spending in some number of European countries, is not worth the damage he's doing. But today. would Obama, if he had a third term, be able to convince Congress that the U.S. should continue in this uneven partnership? Yeah, I, yes. I mean, you know, we need we we did make this a big issue and. You know, got the two percent of GDP defense spending commitment at a NATO summit several years ago. Uh, the direction I think what we needed to show is that the direction was it was moving in a positive direction that that there were increases in defense spending taking place in Europe. Um, but uh, again, I don't think I, I at, no, at no point in the eight years that I was in the White House did I ever think that anybody in Congress or the White House was questioning the underlying importance of NATO. I mean, there was some frustration about defense spending, but it wasn't like people were saying, well, we shouldn't, <laughs> we shouldn't stick with this alliance. Or, um, so um, uh, so I, I think you know, Trump is creating a, 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 an atmosphere of crisis that is not necessary. If we may step aside for a moment, uh, many people in the Netherlands have been watching um, House of Cards and Homeland. Yeah. yeah. Um, do we're not free to watch yes. House of Cards anymore because it's politically inconceivable that you watch it. Yeah, yeah. But have those programs a sense of reality to you and, and, and what elements are and are not? Yeah. So it's pretty funny. Um, I was once at a table with the cast of Homeland at some event and I kept telling the things that I thought were not accurate. You know, I said, we would never have our, our phones in those rooms You know, you know, there, there, we would never have conversations on open uh, telephone lines about all the things that Claire Danes is discussing. You know, and they kind of looked at me like I was the most annoying person. <laughs> you know, you know, like what, who does, why is this guy? But I, I, I think um, so. I, look, I, I, I enjoy them. Um, I, I think Homeland uh, is, you know, it, it starts from some seed of reality and then it it moves very quickly into scenarios that could never it's pretty topical it's exactly so it's topical without being accurate if, if that makes sense house of cards the same thing like there's um it started from certain depictions of washington that felt true but then it quickly moved to to more extreme circumstances i think what's kind of interesting to realize culturally is that When we were in office, um, the most you know popular of those shows was probably House of Cards. Um, I think people watched the version that is the opposite of the current White House. So I think right now, like a because when and when George W. Bush was in office, the popular American political show was West Wing, which is about very serious people taking things very seriously. So part of me wonders if. Uh, Uh, if during Trump's uh, administration there'll be some some show that is once again about very serious people <laughs> taking the job very seriously, and House of Cards was kind of the Obama escapism. You mentioned the Bush uh, government. Have you, over the course of the years, come to appreciate the Bush people more than you did in the beginning? Yes and no. I mean, these days they seem to be sage and well. Yeah, I mean, uh, on the one hand, very considered diplomats. Yeah. Well, on the one hand, let us not forget the Iraq War and the financial crisis. Um, They left. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, the, they were tied directly, both of them, to decisions made. I mean, the, the Iraq War entirely to decisions made by the Bush administration. The financial crisis, I think, pretty directly. Nobody to, can to have some a proof policies. who's responsible yeah. for the economy. But um, that said, to give them credit, you know, they were – Effect, or they were recognizable, if not effective, um, uh, stewards of American institutions and alliances. And, you know, there's a continuum that every U.S. president since World War II had been on where you care about American democratic institutions and you care about the effectiveness of our alliances and you – inhabit a certain form of leadership and you have shifts in priorities right and policies but you don't have shifts in the overall orientation trump is a break from that entire continuum right so 
um, again, George W. Bush and Barack Obama had very different policies, but they were both committed to the Atlantic Alliance and democratic institutions and the promotion of of democracy um, and democratic values. Uh, Donald Trump is not any of those things. He's hostile to the Atlantic Alliance. And you think he might break democratic institutions in the United States? I think he will test. Yes, I, I don't think he. I don't know that he will, but I think he will. He is trying. I mean, he already is. I mean, he's attacking the independence of the rule of law in the United States, the ability to have investigations that are not uh, you know, controlled by the president. Um, he attacks the media on a daily basis, so the concept of a free press. He clearly would be more comfortable with uh, a state-run media. I mean, the, the, it, it's like me saying he's racist. These things are not – I don't think they should be controversial. He says every day that – I mean, he, this is someone who said he wishes that Americans looked at him like North Koreans look at Kim Jong-un. Like he, if he had it his way, we would have a state-run media, and he would control – Um, um, all American institutions. He would control the, the rule of law in a way that no president is supposed to in a, in a constitutional democracy. So he how would like it, that. I don't know that he'll achieve it, but he would like to do that. How come in a, in a truly democratic country, so many people don't mind he is feeling so chummy with dictators around the globe and is telling off his old allies People don't realize because Fox doesn't report it? No, they report it. But the funny thing about it is, you know, it was fascinating um, when Barack Obama said way back in the campaign, just to take one example, um, in the 2008 campaign, I described in the book the first week I went to work for him, he said in a debate that he'd be willing to meet with Iran and Cuba and North Korea. Um, and Fox went ballistic and they said you know he's selling out america and he's un-american and we got attacked for that position the entire eight years i was there um now trump goes and meets with the, the leader of north korea doesn't even really get anything out of it and they're celebrating him on fox news right um i think what it tells you is that there's a faction of american politics that has become so tribal um that they're blinded to any objective truth, you know, or, um, and, and I, again, I do attribute that to uh, the kind of creation of a, a media ecosystem where 35% of Americans just live in like a totally alternative reality. And if you want to understand it, uh, just, you know, watch Fox News for a week and you'll understand exactly what I'm, I'm saying. Done. Yeah, you, you know, you, it's, it's like it's not uh, like – It's, it's, it's what it must be like to live in a totalitarian state where the, there's, there's just a state-run media that, you know, whatever. You know, with Trump one day, when Trump was threatening to go to war with North Korea, he was a genius for doing that. When he said, you know, suddenly Kim Jong-un is beloved by his people and an honorable man, he was a genius for doing that. It, it, it is really that extreme of a, a form of totalitarianism, right, that he could do one thing one day and, and he has a whole media that will say that that is exactly right. And he could do something entirely different the next day and they'll say it was entirely contradictory and they'll say it's exactly right. And so to me, that's, that's the, the, what explains it and it's, it's very dangerous. Do you see any Democrat on the horizon who might be able to catch part of those people and lure them back into democracy? I don't, you know, it's a, I don't know. I mean, I, I, the Democrats, what will happen with the Democrats is, you know, we have the election in November. They frankly don't need a, a leader to win that election. They, they need people in our congressional elections tend to vote against things. You know, so I think the Democrats will be very motivated to vote uh, because there's a lot of hostility to Trump. And frankly, there are more Democrats in the United States than Republicans. So if our people vote, you know, you can win an election. Um, but then we will need to choose somebody. Uh, I think you'll have a wide open field. Um, and it's not enough to just be against Trump. Like that we're going to have to have a, you know, you, you can win a congressional election by opposing 
uh, Trump, you cannot win a presidential election. You need a different message, a different messenger, someone who can not just be against Trump but for something. Um, and and that you know, my hope is that that the process of selecting that person you know selects someone who has considerable political skill. Um, whether or not that person can puncture that bubble, I just don't know. They don't necessarily have to to win. Um, you know, you can. You know, Obama won just by turning out more Democrats. Basically, more young people voted, more African Americans voted, and that was enough to win. Um, I don't know what's going to reach those people. What um, need to be the characteristics of the the Democrat who might have a chance to win? So I think I think that the Democrats do better with outsiders, people who are who, who run as reform minded outsiders. If you look at Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, and Jimmy Carter, the last three Democrats to win the presidency, they were all perceived as coming from outside of Washington, um, being insurgents, being reformers. When we nominated Hillary Clinton, John Kerry, Al Gore, you know, we lost. When we, insiders. The insiders, right? And so, and this may be also be how you reach those people, is that I think those people kind of live in a perpetual state of anger. Um, at some perceived establishment. And and I think that you have a better shot at reaching those people if you have someone who is from outside of Washington. You know, Hillary Clinton was in many ways, you know, for all of her qualities, um, the perfect foil for Trump because, you know, she just had been around for so long and she was seen as so, such a part of the Washington political establishment. It allowed him to run, even though he's this billionaire, um, as this kind of outsider, um, outside the elite, you know, um, somebody who is someone who is not of the elite <laughs> can can really, uh, you know, reach the way to reach those people. I think is to cast Trump as out of touch with them. Um, uh, I mean, I'll just give you one more example, which is in 2012 when we ran against Mitt Romney. You know, you always have a, a negative argument about your opponent. We had basically one argument about Mitt Romney, which is he's the kind of guy who would fire you from your job. <laughs> and it was highly effective because even, you know, the working class white people, they saw that. They looked, Romney looked like the CEO who lays you off, you know. Yeah, um, that's, that's Hillary, deadly. Yeah, Hillary never, her message against Trump, I remember seeing some of her closing advertisements and by the end of the ad, I didn't know what I was supposed to be angry about. You know, he had bad language. He abused women. He made fun of disabled people. He was reckless. All true. But there were so many criticisms that none of them stuck. No focus. You, know, you have to pick one thing and just stick to it. And, and, um, or maybe two things. But uh, And so there was a lack of focus of, even in the argument against Trump. And so... You know, I think someone needs to be able to run from the outside and be able to say very clearly, this guy said he would stick up for you, and he didn't. You know, he took care of his rich friends. Uh, I mean, if you want to reach those white working class voters, I mean, that's all true, by the way. <laughs> so you have to run from the outside and say, this guy said he'd stand up for you, but he lied to you. And he stuck up for his rich friends, yeah. uh, and you're going to get hurt. To wind up, how did you survive, what was it, nine, ten years in, in, in the bubble? If I see Carrie in yeah. Homeland again, making excuses all the time to her sister. Yes. How did you survive as a family man? Um, it was very hard. Uh, y you know, I, I wanted to show in the book how a job like that does challenge you personally. And... I have to say, every relationship in my life changed. You know, like I, you, you lose touch with friends. You're not present um, as much as your wife would like. Um, you know, I, I, my my brother works in the media, so I couldn't really talk to him. And, and so I, 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 you know, I did in some ways. Uh, a part of me didn't survive. I guess is a way of putting it. Is that you know, who I was when I went into that job. Um, a part of that person <laughs> did not emerge on the other end. Um, I, but I do think that uh, in, the reason I was able to is that, you know, as hard as it was, um, 
I never felt like I was kind of compromising myself. Like I, I believed enough. I didn't agree with every single thing Barack Obama you write did. Write in the book that sometimes you 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 began feeling shaky about who was the real Ben Rhodes. Yes, yeah, yeah. No, I did, and and but as long as I knew, like I was saying, I even if I had individual things that I I might have disagreed with Barack Obama about, I I believed in what he was doing, and so I felt like I wasn't compromising myself. That like that I was a part of something that was worth it. Um, And 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 that was enough, I think, to sustain me uh, through some difficult times. Along with, you know, having a wife who who was ultimately patient, even if she was at times very impatient. Overall, she understood that too. I mean, the most remarkable thing to me was that, as I depict, you know, for all the times I had to leave, for all the things I couldn't be there for, um, I actually, when I was thinking of leaving the most seriously, she said. Don't do that. You'll never forgive yourself if you if you if you leave. You know. So even she got that that in the in the end, this was the best thing for for me, even if uh, it wasn't the best way to live out your thirties. <laughs> is it is it just desperate optimism to think that the pendulum will swim back to some sort of Obama? I I I think so. I mean I. I could make all the arguments, you know, for why. I mean, demographically, America is changing. Um, I think America will look more like Obama than Trump in 10 years. Um, and look, if you're not optimistic, um, then, then you know, you can't get out of bed in the morning. <laughs> uh, so you, you have to choose to believe these things. It's like what you're saying is, were we too good for it? No, I, I think it's like there's good and bad in humanity. And, and if, you, if you don't make yourself believe in the good – then you know the bad will prevail. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Thank you. You've been listening to our podcast interview with Ben Rhodes, longtime advisor of President Barack Obama. In the side notes, you may find a review of the book he just published by George Packer of The New Yorker. I'm Mark Chavant. <laughs>